What can you take me back to Razor Ramon? What it was like during that feud that you guys had, that Intercontinental feud? You know, it was right before the Attitude Era. I came in in, in October of 1993, and, and as we talked as before, we got going. It, is that it was in an era that 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 WWF was coming out of you know a down period with the steroid scandal and the government scandal and things. You know, we were coming to the Garden and and every uh, ever, I think it was every other month and every third month. Uh, also uh, out on Long Island at Nassau. And 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 in uh, in Jersey, you could see the crowds get a little bit bigger every month, a little bit bigger. And and I got to give credit to to cause that that nucleus was Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, uh, the Diesel. first Diesel, uh, Yokozuna, uh, the pieces of the yeah, yeah Amen. Uh, but you know, uh, and, and Scott or Razor Ramon was a big big part of that. He he was Razor Ramon. He is Razor Ramon. Uh, you know that his, his you know later when he went to WCW and with Scott Hall, that was still. Hey yo, that was still Razor. He was still Razor, and you know it goes without saying his athletic ability and his mind for the business and and and, and all that. But he knew how to connect. He connected with you as a young man, obviously, and he connected with literally millions around the world. It was it was a cool time, and we had about a you call it in the business. We were married to one another for about <laughs> for about twelve months. Back then, they did mostly high school gyms. They weren't doing big buildings, at least for the TV tapings, and. Uh, my first one, we were in this huge room, man. The, the, the dressing room might have been the high school gym. And then, like, they had another little arena next right. to it. Because it was just this huge room where everybody was just kind of laid around, you know, sprawl, uh, big stars and everybody just sitting there kind of getting dressed and had their own corner or whatever. And uh, first opponent was Diesel. And they told me straight up, man, they said, Diesel had just done a job on a pay-per-view, I think. And they said, he just lost, so he has to look strong. And, and they down now told me, we're putting a strap on him. He said, so he's got to look good. We're going to put the strap on him. So he has to look strong against you. I don't, I don't give a fuck. Right, exactly. I'm on TV. I don't care. So uh, I go out there, and Sean was his manager. And uh, I'm, I do the deal with Diesel. And uh, afterwards, man, I, I go back in and you know, try to be humble and stuff. And, man, Diesel did me right, dude. He walks in, and Off is on the far side of where Diesel walked in. And instead of Diesel going over, kept going over to Off and saying, you know, he did a good job. He screams, Off! You brought over a good one. And he definitely did it intentionally, you know? Right. And him and Sean and uh, Kid, one, two, three, Kid, they all took a liking to me, right? I guess right off the bat. I was going to ask you, is there anybody in the locker room you connected with? Yeah, those guys right off the bat. Um, but yeah, definitely Kid, Sean, and Nash. You know, those guys really. But it was the one thing that was frustrating because the Hardys were there at the exact same time. And me and Kidman, we, we, you know, they always brought Kidman too, but they never used them ever. To the point once where Scott was really hurt. Scott Hall's shoulder was hurt. They put him out there with one of these big fat job guys. I was like, how the fuck? And he, I, I was right there and he's telling Patterson, how the fuck am I going to put him up and raise his edge? Look at this fat fuck. Right, right in front of the guy. I'm like, holy <laughs> shit. He goes, you guys bring this fucking kid here. And he's pointing to kid. He goes, you bring this motherfucker here every fucking TV and you never use him. And he's good. Let me work with him. And Pat... Pat had him come in and said, take off your shirt, which, you know, we all knew about Pat at that point. Right. I looked at Kim and he looked at me and I'm like, what are you going to do, dude? But Pat just wanted to see how he looked without a shirt off the TV and he went, <laughs> So Scott goes, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to let this fat fuck beat the fuck out of me, I'm going to hit him with one punch and pin him. Right. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was pissed, he wanted to work with Kidman, you know, wow. he wanted someone to do this, but I think he ended up putting, sitting the guy in the corner. And then getting behind them, and you know, and I mentioned before that the Hardys were there with us, and me and Kim and you see, and you know, that's when, that's when the click started. Man, Razor and 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 Sean and Kevin and, and the kid, man, they would sit in front of that monitor, in front of everybody, dude, and just bury fucking people left and right. But they would also put people over, man. And I remember straight up Scott Hall one day with me and Kim and sitting right there, and they were watching Jeff Hardy. I don't know, motherfuckers. They need to sign this motherfucker now. Huh. And I remember being so fucking. I like Matt and Jeff, even from back then. We knew, each, you know, we started, you know, because we we saw each other a lot of tapings, and I liked those guys, and, and I respected them. But man, I was so fucking jealous when, when Scott said that. Man, it pissed me off. I was like, fuck. All right. You know, and it was funny because Kidman never did get to work. He might, he may have done one. I mean, him, got, me and him got to do a dark match in Allentown. Hmm. Um, but you know, so Kidman would always. Feed, give me the feedback of what they would say about me when I'm in the ring. Right. always the students sitting there waiting, you know, listening. And they were always good to me too, but they never said nothing like that. They never said, sign Kenny now. You were there when WCW, I mean, at its peak, yeah. when WCW was kicking our ass. Right. And then you come over here, 
uh, to the turning. WWE when we're kicking their ass. Yeah. But you were in the mix the whole time right. on both sides as they, you know, were doing well, the best business, the most lucrative uh, piece of business in the history of pro wrestling slash sports entertainment. Well, what changed it was Hall and Nash coming to WCW. Right. They shook up Monday Night Raw and changed the whole dynamic. How big was that? Because Enormous. That shook up the whole business. It, it shook changed up the, whole, the whole way the boys were paid. Well, it changed the whole way the boys were paid. It changed how business was done. It changed the heel babyface relationship. I mean, I remember Scott Hall, the first thing, he said, when he first introduced himself, I didn't know Scott's a smartass. Right. He comes up to me and he goes, hey, man, Scott Hall, nice to meet you. Make sure you tuck your chin on my finish. And I went, I looked at him, I said, what, what the F did you just say to me? Yeah. You know, no, it's just, I'm just joking. But I was like. You're in tough guy mode. I, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. hey, hey yeah. this is the way it goes. You know, like, who are you talking to? You know, and then I saw how they went. And it's funny as I saw the locker room change, too, because WCW was very easy when I first started there. Everybody played gin. Everybody played chess or dominoes. Are you kidding me? It was easy. Everybody playing gin and dominoes? Yeah. During the Monday Night Wars? No, until Scott and Kevin got there. Okay. Then when they got there, guys are panicking and doing push-ups and going to the gym a little bit more and getting serious about their angles. And nobody wanted to be a baby face to work against them because Hall and Nash were cooler. They talked better on the mic. They were more real. And a lot of the gimmick guys couldn't right. deal with it. They didn't know how to deal without, oh, if you don't put my gimmick over, right. how right. the hell do I survive? Right. Um, what was the difference uh, between the, the way the two companies were run during the Monday Night Wars, because you got here during both of it. Don't spit, Complete. Don't spit liquid on me. No, sir, I will not. I'm not a beer was it, was, was it just like uh, just uh, Completely different. chaos over there? And WCW wasn't chaos, but there really wasn't anyone in charge. Hogan had intellectual uh, control over his contract. Right. Hall and Nash won the same thing. They had favored nations, so they were crushing it. They would bring in Rodman and Bret Hart and all these other guys, and Goldberg got a better contract. So the other guys made all this money, and Scott and Kevin were such smart businessmen, their contracts kept escalating, and then they didn't want to do as much as they needed to. Right. So the attitude got very, very Is sour. morale bad? Morale got terrible. It went from a very fun place to work to everybody was like a bunch of vicious dogs in the corner snapping at each other. But, I mean, yeah. when we started, when, when Nitro started g gaining momentum and Monday Nitro, it, it, was, it was very evident. You yeah. know, and then so it's like that's, that, that was the dynamic. It's like the, the top guys were older. The mid-card guys were younger. And it was just it was the, the complete and total separation. The... The ones that kind of like sort of bridge the gap, it's like, you know, the top guys have their, you know, Hogan and Macho. These guys have their own locker rooms and stuff, you know, own dress, separate dressing rooms and stuff. And uh, the ones that kind of bridge the gap were like when, when Hogan and, and, uh, and or now Nash and Hall came in. Yeah. Nash and Hall, they dressed with the boys. Mm -hmm. They were with us, the, the mid-card guys, you know, because that's that, – because they came from the WWE, where yep. everybody worked together. I mean, you know, yep. so yep. when yep. they came over to us, they, they like they, you know, they didn't need their own block of room and their own. They, they, they were they were the boys, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of like a uh, that dynamic was interesting when they came in because here was kind of like a shoot thing. It's like here comes the NWO guys, you know, and they're kind of like you know they're they're friends with all the mid card guys, you yeah. know. It's like a, yeah. but but they're but they're top guys. You know, so it's like the, 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 you're looking at like this dynamic is like, you know, you know, Nash is buddying up to like, you know, like like guys like, you know, me and, and Conan and stuff and everything, you know, and all that. And, and you know, he's not really like hanging out with Hogan and these, you know, Macho and these guys. That, 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 those aren't like his his boy, you know, his boys, his boys were the guys in the locker room. Yeah. And it was just interesting to see that dynamic, the growth of the NWO, where, you know, Hall and Nash were becoming the top guys, but they never tried to carry themselves in the locker room over the rest of the boys with that type of ego. You know, yeah, you so know, that, Glenn, that's great to hear. I mean, I, I didn't know that obviously because I wasn't there. And I mean, that's, that's really good to hear on the part of Kevin and, uh, and Scott. You also worked uh, a few times with, with Hall and Nash, which was quite, uh, quite, you know, that was a little bit of a size difference there, but those guys always really liked you. I remember they always they gave you the nickname Ray Ray. Like the, they were really always really good to you, which was rare because they weren't yeah. they weren't good to everybody back in those days. Yeah, it's it's funny, man, because you uh, you mentioning that, Chris. Uh, you know when we did that whole uh, uh, WCW videos uh, for WWE, uh, they had asked me about Hall and Nash, and I said, man, they they were cool with me from the beginning. Yeah. I mean that second pay per view that I had, which was the Great American Bash. Uh, yeah. Remember, we were we were coming from Mexico, so you know, renting cars and uh, was a big problem for us at the beginning. But uh, one of the first 
persons that stood out and, and just pretty much offered a hand was Nash. Uh, right after that pay-per-view, he said, hey, you guys have a ride uh, for um, a Nitro the next day? Like, nah. He goes, I'll pick you guys up. Where are you guys staying at? And uh, he picked Conan up and myself up uh, the following day. He drove us down to, to Nitro, man, uh, which we were doing in Orlando at the time, Universal. Yeah. But, uh, again, man, they, they were always very, very cool. At, at one point, I remember uh, when nobody, when Conan wasn't around or, or none of the boys, Hall, Nash, and myself would be driving down the road, so... They respected you because of you know the reasons that we're talking about. You know, you were you were a smaller guy that came in there and just impressed everybody. You've always been a really respectful guy, and I think they probably. I remember that one time when they did the backstage invasion and, and Nash like threw you like a dart into the side of the of the uh, truck. Do you remember that? It was just he just yeah, flew head first into it and just went boom. I mean, that made him look like a monster. You made him look great that night. I still remember it. It was actually that day that I got the ride. Maybe it was in exchange for the ride, man. Yeah. Now it's starting to hit me. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody can argue the fact that, that Scott Hall and Kevin Nash didn't light up WCW when they went there from WWE oh, they did. as the oh, outsiders, yeah. they, they, were, they, were the, they were the, they lit the fire. Yeah. I don't care who's going to take the credit. There'll be a zillion guys down there that'll take the credit. That's cool. I don't care. They made Nitro relevant. And then Hogan was smart enough to see that, hey, I need to be a part of this deal. Mm-hmm. And Hogan was smart enough to get involved in the NWO. In, in the NWO. If, say he, he vetoes it. I'm not switching. Do you think the NWO is even close to getting this over as they, they did? Or would, would they would fans have, would have turned on Hogan even more trying to fight the NWO? Fans would have turned on Hogan plus... The NWO was so good at their job, they would put the pressure on Hogan where he manipulated it himself to yeah. turn. They were brilliant. I mean, hey, you know, when Kevin Nash and, and Scott Hall had the match with the two strippers, right, and they're mm-hmm. selling. Yeah. Come on, I mean, they were so cool. Hogan needed a refresher, was, and I knew him well. He was uncomfortable how they were getting over. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he was eventually going to change. It might have taken him two more months, and maybe Nash he <laughs> and uh, Hall getting have a few beers in him and saying, "Hey, brother, we need you." Yeah. And that that would have happened. So you you believe if it did happen then he yeah. would have yeah. maybe brought it to you, even yeah. though that you've brought it to him. We all know that he came in with Scott Hall, and even though some people wanted to give the credit to Hulk Hogan and, uh, but the, and, and even Macho, but the guys that turned around that fucking company and lit the fucking business on fire was Hall and Nash. That NWO shit, I remember going to places like Seattle, and the people were going so fucking crazy, they broke the bleachers. I mean, they were fucking rock stars when they went out there, and I was a huge mark for everything they did because it was funny it was topical it was different they were rebellious i mean their shit was on point if we're going to talk about that part of the business no equals but the other part of the business they're fucking cutthroat yeah you see i liked eric as a guy because he was good to me yeah and he had a few good ideas but what, what really killed him bro and i'm sure you'll agree with this when he just attached his wagon to hogan yeah. It was good for him career wise. And look, he's always, you know, trailed behind and got a job based on being tight with Hogan, but it really killed his creativity. He just relied too much on the guy who was even then over the hill. And here's something I'd love to hear your opinion about because I get heat when I say this. But I always say the NWO invasion started dying when Hogan turned heel and joined Hall and Nash. And that doesn't mean Hall and Nash weren't great after that because they were. But the greatest angle in wrestling history then became the Hulk Hogan show. It became revolving around a tired old guy that we had seen the best days of, whereas the other two had such a great cool factor that Hogan really diluted the minute he came in. And then, of course, you split the NWO. WCW never got its heat back. I mean, true, WCW had a great business after Hogan turned, but a lot of that was Sting. A lot of that was Goldberg. A lot of that was the great matches people put on. And a lot of that was Hall and Nash's continued cool. I, 
I always have maintained since Hogan left WWE in 1994, he never helped the company showed a profit after that. He always took out more than he put in. Well, here's the thing, and I've had my problems, personal problems with Nash, so in no way am I kissing his ass on this. I really absolutely agree with you. I thought back then if he if, – if, Eric would have hitched his wagon to Hall and Nash. Maybe a lot of these problems wouldn't have happened because a lot of the problems were, you know, it was Hog- it was Eric siding with Hogan and Eric siding with Hogan's ideas and just fucking being all up his ass. And of course, that got these guys mad because they wanted more money and they want and and then once Hogan got in and he became cool again, because remember he was being booed everywhere. Okay, as a top baby face. And so they had to literally convince him to do it. He did it, you know, and then all of a sudden he was cool. Right. And then all he did was fucking use the power that he had with Eric and the newfound power that he had with being in the NWO to walk all over. You know, you know, he was fucking like he he took over the show, Conan. That's what he did. He took over Nitro. And he was remember, he was even rocking Scott Hall's five day shadow. Remember that? <laughs> I was like, Bro, he had to paint it on, didn't he? Yeah, I, the, like the guys in the fucking companies in your fucking group. You know, if you're gonna steal, steal from somewhere else. You know, for a while he was even wearing baggy pants like I did. But anyways, and then of course, you know that that you know started all the backstage tension where Nash and Hall were like, "Fuck it, we're not gonna give any more good ideas." And then we started the Wolf Pack. And then you know, at that time, me, Nash, and and Luger had tremendous heat with Eric because we kept burying Hulk on TV. You know, we just go into business for ourselves. So he just buried the fucking wolf pack, which was very hot at that time. Here's a, here's a good one for you. Is Kevin still here? Kevin. Kevin Nash. I'm, I'm, I'm at the peak of my career. Stoic sting. Stone-faced sting. Okay? You don't... It's like... NWO hits the ring, all kinds of bodies flying all over the place, sweat, everything, just chaos everywhere. Kevin Nash is next to me. He goes down. I go down. I look over at Kevin. Kevin, are you okay? Yeah. You okay? I go, yeah. So I'm on my left side like this, and this big arm, this big leg comes right over the top of me, and I hear this voice go, Sting, do you mind if I just spoon with you for a minute? And that's a shoot as well. You know what? There's a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes in his business. That, that, that's where the ratings are. That's where the money is, too. How about Scott Hall? I never liked... Uh, I, 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 that was a weird guy. I think obviously because he had so many demons, so many problems. But that was one guy. I fucking hated him in WCW. Did not like him at all. Uh, kind of a bully. And, you know, just a very arrogant, it's just a dick. It's like, you know, his big quote is, this is the wrestling business, not the wrestling friendness. I don't need any friends. Right. It's like, I, I just didn't like him uh, because he was not, he was, you know, he wasn't nice to me. But then, you know, you would, right. you, you would see him at a certain time or a certain place and he'd be a sweetheart. So I think he had a lot of issues and a lot of problems. And you know, he's a drug addict. He's an alcoholic. You can never judge anybody based on that. Um, I wish him nothing but the best. I hope I hope that he can turn his life around or that he has turned his life around. I'll tell you one thing. When, you know, I've never talked to Kevin Nash ever on the phone, but when Scott almost died and I heard that Kevin flew out there to, you know, try and make him live, I called Kevin. I was like, you know, hey, man, if there's anything I can ever do for Scott, let me know. Because, you know, we're all part of one big family, and there's some guys you don't like and some guys you had issues with. And, um, you know, but still, I don't want to see a guy die because of it. I remember he was always such a bully to me that at one point Scott Norton said, uh, he said to me, listen, you don't go tell that guy to fuck off. I will beat your ass. And I'll tell you what, I'll watch <laughs> your back. If you guys do anything or whatever, I got your back. And fucking right. Scott Norton said, got your back. I was like, that's all I need to hear. And I went over to him. I said, he's like, oh, oh what's up, Jericho? How's your little Terry Taylor push? I'll end that in a second. And I was like, that does it. And I went to him. I said, you motherfucker. I said, you want to fucking fight? Let's fight right now. If you don't want to fight, shut your fucking mouth. Don't ever talk to me like that again. He's like, hey, man, I'm just ribbing you. You don't have to be, 
so mean about it. And then after that, he was nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, the two things that I wanted to ask you two things out of that thing you just said. One, what was your opinion of Kevin Nash since you brought him up? Uh, Kevin was a great manipulator. I think Kevin got whatever he wanted out of you. Uh, I think Kevin's a pretty nice guy. Uh, in, in retrospect, very funny, cool to be around. I think he has a, I think actually we had a great match. Probably, one of the, probably the best match he had when he came back to WWE in 2002 for his hair, hair, uh, hair versus hair match. And um, it was another one like the one that you and I had. I, I had some ideas and just in the back of my head, I wanted to prove something. And I, I, I think back, like, fuck, I remember that match being pretty damn good. So, um, you know, Kevin and Scott were the smartest guys in wrestling, man. You can't, you can't, you know, cut them down for, for totally manipulating the system. And, hey, man, we're, we're super over. Created one of the most classic angles of all time. And it would not have worked if they weren't involved. So, um, right. you know, like, like I said, Kevin could work when he wanted to. And I think uh, the older he got, the lazier he got. But I think for a guy that big, he had some pretty damn good matches. And uh, I just saw him a couple weeks ago at the Royal Rumble. And it's always fun to see him. You know, he's always got a smile on his face. And, uh, so I, I, I wish... I, actually, what I'd like to say about all those guys is I wish that I was in the position now... Uh, then, because I never really got to know yeah. Kevin and Scott. You know, there, there was a big wall between all of those guys. Same with Savage. You know, I worked with Hulk when he came to WWE, so I got to know Hulk a little bit. But there's so there's a lot of really cool guys that we never really got to gel with because there was a real uh, no. And you know, and and you know, part of part of the mentality, Chris, was that. You know we're stars and these guys aren't, and sometimes they acted like that. And if you, and if they would have met you now that you are a star, you probably would have met. You know you probably weren't able to bond with them a lot better. But in their mind, it's yeah. like who are these fucking guys? You know what I'm saying? You know, and it, yeah, I do. And like you, you, you bridged the gap. Like you got in with those guys, and Raven to a certain extent got in with those guys. But you were like the only two guys that were part of our gang that kind of crossed that line. So I, you know, I, right. I don't have the same the same uh, experiences that you have. I just think of those guys as being like fucking assholes, but I know they weren't. It's just, once again, it's just the way that it was there for everybody. And it, it, yeah. you know, knowing them the little bit that I know now, we all, we all loved wrestling and we could all go. And I think right. if, if those walls were broken down, we probably could have, like I never once ever went out drinking with, with Kevin or Scott or even with Flair, those guys in WCW. I mean, Flair was always friendly, but you know, there was a different camp. There was the Arn Flair camp, and there was the Savage Hogan camp, and there was the Hall and Nash camp, and there was like our gangs, like you know Chris and Eddie and Dean and, and Ray and you would hang out with us sometimes, or or you know Kurt Henning once in a while would come hang out with us. But there was never like everybody go out together because it wasn't like international trips in WWE either. And in WWE, that's why everybody hangs out internationally in the same hotel. Everyone's drinking with everybody or hanging around. We never had that in WWE, so. There was really never any camaraderie between the two or three different cliques, you know? Right. Because the cliques, because a lot of those cliques actually had heat with each other for real. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and he, that, was part, that was part of the problem. Yeah. I, I remember, I mean, the first day I sat down uh, at the catering with, with Hogan and I think Nash, and they looked, like I was, they looked at me like I was nuts. Like, what do you sit down with us for? It was like high school. Or it's like, oh, you know, right. up with the nerds in the corner, you know, and, and um, <laughs> that's kind of how it was. So, yeah. like I said, all those guys in, in 97, 98 were different in 2008, 2009, and, uh, you know, all, I, like I said, can't really cut anybody down. I have respect for anybody, and especially those guys, they were at the top of the top and drew a lot of money. Let's, uh, let's instead uh, talk about the, the people you're surrounding yourself with. Kevin Nash, who you mentioned is uh, kind of putting off surgery, uh, and I think is a big leader in the locker room, obviously, and, and has been. But what is he really bringing to the table right now? And, and um, you know, kind of tell tell us the story about him and, and what he's been going through the last couple of months. Well, what is it he bringing to the table? And you know what? That's why those other guys, uh, you know, the the other they no, bite right. me. They, um, yeah, bite me. Bite me. Okay, I'm sorry. Take out the eat me. I won't say eat me again. All right. From now on, instead of eat me, I'll say bite me. All right. But you know what? You, you have no idea what Kevin Nash means to this company. And, uh, you know, I mean, 
uh, again, if, if I had to pick one guy or I had to pick three guys, I mean, he would definitely be one of those guys because he's he, he he's done everything we've asked of him. He's elevated guys. He's working with the younger guys. He's playing hurt. I mean, every single thing we've asked of this guy, he has done. And there there, there is nothing in the world that I wouldn't do for Kevin Nash. And, and the bum raps that he gets, it, 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 it's it, it's a joke. It's a joke. Um, the reason Kevin Nash is in that locker room is because he is a leader. And everybody, you know, the, the young kids, they all look up to Kevin Nash. And, um, you know, like I said, those, those that rip Kevin and criticize Kevin, they, they don't have a clue. But those are wannabes that wish they were in the locker room uh, will never have the opportunity to be on this side of the business because they're total marks for what we do. And, um, you know, again, it's just a, uh, you know, it's just sad. My question is, what were your thoughts about working with Scott Hall when you were in that Wolfpack wannabe moment? Oh, he was great. Bro, you got to understand, is that, uh, is, you know, b- back then the, in- the inmates ran the asylum. And they were running the asylum and it was it was doing well. You know, for some, because you know, when you had that many stars, you had a lot of really intelligent input you know, at the top, like a lot of guys had Eric's ear, um, and we were getting some good, te- we were getting some good stuff on TV. Okay, so Scott had always uh, had like, um, like he had Luis Piccoli. Scott knew that if you had like a sidekick guy with you, you could just do, you could just do more entertaining stuff in spots. He was just very smart like that. So, so Scott, they would like, like when they were writing the show or were booking the show, they would give Scott something to do. They wouldn't even – like it started off, they weren't even including me in the angles. He would go back and say, hey, what if I brought Disco out here? And like, you know, bro, I got booked on that sh- – and, and all those angles for like the first six weeks. The, they didn't write it in. After they would figure it out, Scott would go back and say, hey, well, this, I'm going to use Disco here. And they'd say, OK. <laughs> so that's so, so like, I owe I owe a tremendous amount to that guy. But but he knew that I, that I knew what I was doing out there. You know, he wanted a guy that like, you know – that just had timing and stuff and everything. We, we could do spots and, and, and a guy that could take the bumps for him that, that wouldn't have to, you know, that wouldn't have to like, so he wouldn't have to take big bumps and stuff. I mean, that's just the way that he was, he was smart like that. What about Kevin Nash? Some of your early impressions of uh, Kevin. Kevin Nash, I love him. He's such a great guy. I mean, he pretty, he pretty much just says it how it is. And, you know, he was one of the, basically he was the reason I was hired by WCW. It was his idea. He, he had followed me through my fitness competitions, knew who I was from fitness magazines. And he's the one that said to me, you know, we have this storyline idea. Would you be interested in trying it out for a little while? And it was him that really like spearheaded the whole thing. So, I mean, I really have him to thank Hmm. for getting into this business. Can, Can you talk to me about your relationship with Kevin? Um, let me tell you, let me just say that. I mean, I have a lot of, I have a lot of respect for Kevin because, you know, he took the natural born thrillers. He took a certain guy, he took guys under his wings and, you know, I, I mean, Kevin's 80% business. He's like, he's, he's all about business, but he often said, man, he's like, he's like, I'm not doing it unless it's fun. It's got to be fun. And, and that's, and honestly, that's kind of how I am with my life. But Mike, what, what we're talking about here is how, how wrestlers and the business itself takes itself so so seriously, bro, to the point of nausea. Th- that's what we're talking about here, bro. The people involved, the people in power positions, everything is so freaking serious that when you have somebody that comes along that is themselves and that it, that is funny and entertaining and not afraid to be themselves, well, that that's how you draw heat on yourself. The reason why Kevin Nash never had heat with himself, let, let, let's face it, you and Kevin were, were identical in personalities nobody's gonna mess with kevin nash because of the way he looks and this is what i this is what i love about kevin okay like you mike kevin was never in it didn't matter who you brought in i never witnessed kevin nash once ever trying to keep anybody else down at the end of the day kevin wanted to make sure he made more money than them you know, because to Kevin, that's what it was all about. But, bro, you, you could have brought in somebody twice the size of Kevin, and Kevin would have never played a political game to try try to keep that guy at bay. He was never, never, you know, I don't think Kevin's ever 
to me, you just know him and know he's, he's never been never been worried about his spot because he knows how to hold on to his spot and he wants to have fun. He, he's, I don't think Kevin's ever been worried about his spot. He's made a yeah, lot of money cool. and he's six foot 10, 11. And, you know, he's got charisma and he's Kevin Nash. So he's not worried. I mean, he tried to help. Uh, like he was somebody much like yourself that wasn't worried about any of those natural born thrillers taking his spot. He wanted to see these guys because a lot of those guys enjoyed the same kind of camaraderie and the same kind of goofiness that Nash brought to the table. He could gish it out and give it back. And Was uh, Kevin Nash a helpful off uh, camera? Or was that just like a yeah. no no it, it was it was really that was that was what the kind of cool thing about WCW was you know um, he, he, in my time you know like when he was our coach on when he was our coach on TV he was also really our coach like in in general you know being be, how to socialize around the boys and and mix in blend in the locker room and stuff you know and because sometimes it's a lot of people's problems you know they can be the, you can be the best wrestler in the world but if you come into a WWE locker room and you're a a social moron, and you know, and you can't you can't hold a conversation with a guy or blend in. You know, you're going to get ran out of there. You know, and 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 Kevin Nash was one of those guys that took us aside and kind of showed us the ropes. You know, you know, Kevin Nash. You know, he he really he helped bring me along and stuff. You know, he matured me and, and as far as like locker room etiquette. You know, and yeah, a lot of people, you know, think he's always just out for himself, but. A lot, of, a lot of the guys that we've had on and stuff say that you know he had really helped them in their career, and he's helped some guys and some of the young guys in TNA trying to get them bigger, uh, bigger shots and help them with their characters. So sometimes I think he gets a bad rap. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Uh, you know, he, uh, I, I didn't see any of that. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, maybe you know, we're we're not on the level. I was never on the level of Kevin Nash either, but so I can't speak for up there. You know, but. uh but I will tell you this, you know, he, he, he always has said, you know, I, in this business you can make friends or you can make money. And he said, I, I make money, you know. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's, just, that's just the way it is, you know. But to uh, us, he was, he was cool, always cool. Yeah. And that's usually who you're, you're going to be the most, you know, people that are jealous or people trying to hold the people down. You try to hold the young guys down, you know. And he, he wasn't like that at all. He, he gave us tips. He, he watched their match. You know what it felt like for a, a guy like Kevin Nash to watch her just stand in the monitor and and watch our match and then and, and then critique it afterwards. That that made us feel good, you know. Mm-hmm. Forget about all the people in the stands and forget about you know the fact that he was he was watching and and was ready to critique. That was always cool, you know. Especially when you're a young guy getting into the business, you know. Remember we had a, and I don't know if you were on it or not. But we had a European tour with WCW one time, and everyone was just sitting around bitching. And there was you know one time where they had a charter flight for us, and all of the guys that had first class in their contract. You know, we're complaining that this is a breach of contract because this private charter plane we have technically doesn't have first class. And according to their contract, they don't need to board the flight. And they even dubbed it the breach tour. Um, you know, I don't have to go because it says so in my contract. Who were some of the people that were saying that? Um, I don't want to throw people under the bus. Well, throw um, one because throw- let me just say this. Uh, yeah, well, there's a there's a segment, there's another segment on this show called "Please Don't Blue Ball the Audience," and that's when you like hint a little something, but then you don't do it. Uh, uh, so please, you may have to throw one person under the bus. Okay, the the guy that dubbed it the breach tour over the first class was Kevin Nash. <laughs> <laughs> was there anyone Why on the line or listening? Was there anyone listening that that wasn't their first guess? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, just now they know for sure. Any memories of the Raw match in which Kevin Nash tore his quad? Yeah, I was right there. I was outside the ring and I saw it, boom, he fell right down right down in front of me, man. I, and I jumped right down to see UK and I could see that he was in pain in his leg. You, you could tell, you know, that he had messed up his leg pretty bad. And it's unfortunate for tall guys like that sometimes, just like Sid, say for instance, coming off the top rope or the second rope or whatever and just snapping his leg in half, you know. When you're tall-legged like that and your adrenaline's going, you know, you don't really realize it. But when you see it on TV and it happens, it, it just goes, oh, it grosses you out. You know, these big guys that are so strong and powerful and, and uh, muscular, you know, that, that uh, something could happen to them like that, you know. And the, the leg just flipped over and Kevin Nash's quad just, boom, you saw it buckle and he laid right there and it's you okay, okay. And we're calling for the medics to come out, you know, it just, it sucks for any of the boys to get hurt. I hate that, you know. Do you think Kevin 
is still or can or can still be a draw today. Oh yes, definitely. Kevin's a big draw. It's a big draw if he's pushed the right way right now in any company around the world. Yes, definitely. If he came back to WWE tomorrow and was pushed the right way, yes, big draw. Okay, the next one's gonna be a mouthful, so bear with me there, Dustin. Fine. Uh, speaking of Kevin, he said a few months back about your father. We're doing role wrestling and we're on Fox Sports Net. We're in the 27th largest metropolitan area and that's it. We should be, we should be doing urban wrestling. We're doing rural. Dusty sits, sits in the back of a pickup truck with hay bales. Hey Dusty, quick clue. A little something from me to you. Become Fat Joe. Have a couple of black, black babies and be in an Escalade. Then we'll, then, we'll, then we'll do a number of high ratings. What the fuck's going on? I'm 46 years old, and I'm the hippest guy in the room. What the fuck is that? Any thoughts on any of that whole... Well, who wrote that? Did, did that come out of his mouth for sure? Well, he, he, supposedly he... He it was, was actually in, a printed interview from... Okay, well, with the Kevin Nash, you know, he had a big... Uh, they built up a big deal for him and Jeff Jarrett, you know, in the press conference deal for the world title. And, uh, you know, uh, I love Kevin. He's a good guy. And Kevin has a unique since he sees a lot too he's very very creative too you know and not everybody agrees with my dad on his creative abilities or anybody else's you know everybody has their own creative abilities and if he said something like that then he saw something different that might have worked or whatever you know and you just got to go with it I don't, I don't think bad about that you know and uh scott hall was another one mm -hmm. uh, big time believed in me man um, yeah and because Scott was also the tale of two people as well. When Scott was sober, he was a super nice guy from my uh, experiences. But then when he got you know, messed up, he would turn into a real different person. Right. You didn't see that side? I never saw that side. Good. That's good. Never saw, Sweet I, guy. I've heard about it, man. And um, I've grown to love Scott. Scott, mm -hmm. um, he, man, he would talk to me so much, man. And just like um, I would just soak the knowledge up, man. That, uh, I would hear all the mistakes Scott made. I would hear all the mistakes people making. I would hear all that, and he would teach me and tell me to like, you can counteract this. You don't have to be like that. You don't have to. And he he really took time to school me, man. Hmm. A lot of time to school me. You know, have you ever met a guy maybe in school or at work or something like that who just charmed the pants out of everybody with his wit and his intelligence, but you knew him better than the other people? You knew just what an asshole he really was. Sure. Okay, well, that's Kevin Nash. If you don't really know him that well, you know, he'll make you laugh. He'll, fuck, he's funny, you know, and, and wow, he's smart. And, you know, so that's the shield that he puts up. And you're so kind of in awe that he's also a superstar who's talking to you. And, um, and he's really got ulterior motives. And I think as far as um, TNA, between him being witty, and, you know, they, he was a champion in WWE before, and... Um, you know, these guys, they don't watch, you know, they don't really watch ROH all that much. They don't really watch, you know, the indie scene. So all they really know are the guys that they knew who were stars. You know, they don't, you know, they see Sanjay and Saban and Shelly and all these guys, and they're just like, oh, those guys don't know how to sell. They have no psychology. You know, they've never been anywhere. You know, so they feel Nash has paid his dues. He has been in the big time. He was a champion. He got over in WCW. He got over in, in, NW, uh, in WCW. He got the NWO and the Wolfpack over. So in their mind, it's like, why would we put somebody on our roster who's never done anything anywhere when I've got a guy here? So that's kind of their thinking, you know, and that's what's hurting the company because you've got a lot of guys that are ready to step up and you've got a lot of guys in their way. And the booking team doesn't help it matters any. Let me ask you this, though. I mean, do you think Kevin Nash and those that do exactly what you're talking about, the Hulk Hogan's? Now, I, I, would, I would probably say that I know <laughs> uh, in Hulk Hogan's case, but in Kevin Nash's case and some of these others, I mean, it's a cutthroat business. Do you think these guys are doing it intentionally? Do you think Kevin, Cash, or Kevin, Kevin Nash does that exact thing that you're talking about intentionally, or is it just kind of the way that, he's it, the way that he is and he doesn't even realize he's doing it? What part intentionally? I mean, the, the smooth talking just to get his, his ulterior oh, no, motive no. over on them. Oh, he knows exactly what he's doing. I traveled with him in a car for two years. He knows he's, he's way smarter than anybody on that booking committee. He knows what he's doing. He, laugh, he makes them laugh, and you know, he buries the guys that he knows Jeff doesn't like. And, right. you know, he, he knows how to play. And then he goes to the dress room, and he buries Jeff. Oh, that fucking booking sucks. You know, I can't believe they're not using you guys. And then he'll hear guys complain and go back to Jeff and go, man, can you believe this guy? All he does is complain, man. He's never done shit in this business. So he plays both sides. You know what I'm saying? And, um, and 
you know, he hasn't been called on it yet. But as of late, you worked a lot with Kevin Nash. Uh, your thoughts on uh, working with him? You know what? It's uh, it's been good. You know, it's it, at first, you know, I'll be honest, you know, honestly, I mean, me and Kev didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. Um, there really wasn't that kind of established respect between us. But I can understand within the last uh, within the last probably four or five months. I mean, uh, me and Kevin really. Uh, come together and I mean he's, he's a guy that I you know I respect a hell of a lot more than when I first met him and uh, I think very highly of him and I think uh, you know he's definitely got a mind that's uh, above and beyond and far more cerebral than most people that I've ever met so uh, you know I, I did Kevin a lot man he's, he's, a, he's a really good person and uh, he's, he's a great uh, asset to uh, this business uh, TNA brought back people and, and, and you know they gave him second and third chances I know you did a shoot interview on, on a pay-per-view last year. If they did somehow give Scott Hall a chance to come back one last time, what would your uh, reaction be to that? Um, you know what? Uh, in all honesty, if Scott was ready to go, and if you know, I, I know a lot of people close to him. They say that he's ready to make those type of changes, and, and he's ready to be productive and be a contributor. Which is really all I ask from anybody that I work with is that if you're going to show up, if you're going to show up in TNA, you know, show up with your boots on have them laced up and come to work you know don't don't think you're going to come in here and you know catch an easy payday or you know take, catch an easy go thing then I'd be more than receptive to having them back because let's face it you know at the end of the day Scott Hall you know he's responsible for some of the most memorable things in professional wrestling and uh, you know he's responsible for you know drawing a lot of money in professional wrestling and if there's some if there's some possible way that we can recapture that there's some possible way that we can uh, you know capitalize on that and, it's, and Scott can capitalize on it and it's a positive for everybody then why not Oh, I just wanted to ask, you know, you and Kevin Kevin Nash had a pretty good match together. Did you guys plan on doing something pretty special? You know what? Um, no, I mean, I really didn't know what to think about that match, you know, even, you know, seconds before we went out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, I, you know, Kevin was very, very high on it afterwards, and a lot of people were, to the point where, you know, my... Well, this isn't the same as being high in a match as it is, you know, concerned. Where I got a call from my uh, my uh, oldest son, you know, and I listened to him about an uh, hour after the match, and he's like, "Dad, uh, I watched the match in a friend's house, and I'm hoping you can see." <laughs> you know, he's, and even threw in an "I love you," which you know you don't <laughs> often get from an 18 year old. And I was like, I called him up, I'm like, "Yeah, I'm okay. You know, I got a couple stitches. I'm all right." And um, when I saw the match back several months later, I was very impressed by, you know, by Nash's, you know, his intensity and just the idea that we kind of suspended disbelief, even among, you know, longtime wrestling fans to the point where people thought this guy, Kevin Nash, like was actually trying to cost me my, you know, my eye. Like it was believable in a way that, uh, you know, most things in pro wrestling, including almost everything I've been involved with, uh, is not. So, I, I, you know, we did do something pretty cool. And I think if we had been in an arena as opposed to the impact zone, it would have translated even better. But uh, that was not something – I was not expecting anything uh, special. I, 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 Before the flare match, really, I, I would just go out with the hope of not, uh, you know, not embarrassing myself. I was signed to TNA at 21 years old. You know what I mean? Like, uh, So all of these – and at the time – the, the guys on top were like Sting, Kurt Angle, uh, Mick Foley, Kevin Nash, Scott Steiner, Booker T, all the guys that I'd grown up watching on TV as a child. You know, so I was like super, super nervous to, to, to go there. And I remember from, I don't want to call it propaganda, but from certainly a little bit of revisionist history, uh, you know, of WCW and everything else, that I was really, really nervous about being around Kevin Nash and Scott Steiner because I'd heard all these stories about how awful they were and they were really, you know, rotten backstage and blah, blah, blah. And those two, just by chance, were the coolest guys to me. People forget that, like, in my first year, like, I, I suddenly out of the blue, I got, like, I was booked in a TV an Impact main event with Sting. Yeah. Like, I, and I really, like, Really, for no other reason other than the fact that, like, we were we were kind of semi in a group kind of feud, you know, like the the British Invasion yeah. slash, slash uh, other heels, you know, <laughs> were kind of, were kind of working against all the other kind of white meat baby faces, and it was just one of those things where they just went, 
uh, let's put him in there with Sting. I think Sting, Sting, you know, took a he took a liking to me um, very early on, and I, and I can't like I can't express um, enough, you know, how um, you know absolutely uh, you know beneficial and important that was to me. Yeah. Um, the comments thing, Kevin Nash as well. Like after we had that, I had that match with Sting. That was the first day that. Kevin Nash came and talked to me. Like he walked over to me and was like, in 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 only you know, Kev is like the coolest, you know. Like he doesn't, you know, he does it. He speaks in sound bites. Like he doesn't have to say very much. Thing he does, everything he does say is like completely poignant and and you know memorable. And he just walked over to me and was like, "Hey, saw your match with Stinger. It was a good job. I'll be talking to you again." And I was just kind of like, "Oh." Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Nash. You know, like, uh... Jay had a great story he told us that, like, we, we still, to this day, the, the, yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. He did an indie show with Nash, and Nash uh, was really open with how much he was making that night. <laughs> he was telling everybody he made five grand <laughs> the whole night, I guess. So, Nash, uh... I Doug, do that, too. <laughs> yeah, well, I text 3.0. Yeah. Yeah. I text them how much money I made. Yeah, you send, oh, we do that, too. We, we send did, Watch we did Castro. Tonight, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We send Watch Castro to the Cutlers at home. Hey, guys, check it out. Like, yeah. So, uh, anyway, so the story is, I guess Nash is, you know, he's really open about what he was making. And he does his match, and he's all sweaty. He's in the back. And the promoter comes up to him, and he says, Hey, man, this ma- next match, can you come out there and, 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 and powerbomb one of the guys? And Nash goes, ha, For an extra five grand... And apparently the, the promoter, promoter was a money says, mark. Okay, no, fuck. He gave fine. him five grand yeah. to go back out. One power and Jay, another Jay power was power sitting bomb. right there. Jay was like, "Oh my god, you just got paid." <laughs> so for the long, for like grand. for like a year at TNA, like whenever we were asked to do anything, we go, "Yeah, for another yeah. five grand." You want to go to K? <laughs> the next, yeah. but tell for me this: Did Jay grand. tell you if? When the promoter said yes, the Nash would go, holy shit. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. sold. That was nothing to him, man. Okay. Yeah. No, so it would have been so yeah. good if Nash would holy fuck, he's going to do it. <laughs> when we, he doesn't care. He's, when when we, uh, that's with, probably nothing compared to what his Oh, were. what he's seen? Oh, yeah. Five grand changes my fucking yeah, life. Dude, yeah. when we, we worked him and Eric Young as a, as a tag team on three house show loops, right? So the finish was we go for more bank for your buck, but I have Eric up, right? And Kevin does a blind tag. We hit more bank for your buck. Yep. I do the moonsault. But the ref doesn't count because Nash is legal, right? I turn around, Nash big boots boot, me, right? finish. That's it. So the first night, no we, jackknife. No, he didn't. Not well, extra I, asked him, I asked he him. I asked him. Give me the me. power bomb. He said, on a house show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody's watching this. He's like, what do you think this is? Pay per view. Yeah. He's like, this isn't WrestleMania, guys. Yeah. He actually tried to get it changed. He, they were the champs at the time. They wanted to. He wanted to drop the yeah, belt. That's how awesome. On the he first is. show, he and then we switch you back. The belt. And he's like, I want to go talk to the office. And they said no. He's like, so, this is what's wrong with wrestling nowadays. Yeah. They don't let me do stuff like this. <laughs> I was like, I'm trying to help the younger guys. Yeah. He said that. I'm trying to help the younger guys. We came back to the hotel, and there's Kevin Nash in the lobby with a, two cases of beer and a bunch of people around him. And uh, this guy, Justin Labar, was there, and he he uh, he ran up to me. He's like, hey, man, how you doing? He knew me, and he's like, did you want to meet Nash now? And I was like, yeah. So... Justin's like, hey, man, this is the kid you're working. Da, da, da. And Nash just kicked out a chair. And he said, sit the fuck down. The beer's over there. And I was like, oh. I'll tell you what, Eric, you are not. You might not be aware of this. I'm, you know, I don't know if you talked to Kevin or not, but I, I, I see Kevin Nash a lot, like, at events and signings and stuff, right? And I have introduced him to some people that I work for. And... Um, so when the when the WWE dropped Hulk, and I was going to ask you, I, this is a good question to ask. Eric, Great question. I'm curious too. When they when the WWE dismissed Hulk with all the stuff that went down, I didn't know that he and Kevin Nash owned fifty percent of the NWO merchandise. Did you know that? I did not know that. Yeah, somehow Hulk and Kevin Nash bought. 50% of the NWO merchandise rights. And I, I don't know how they could have done that without you knowing about it before it went to WWE. And so when Hulk and this thing went down with the WWE and Hulk, they took the NWO merchandise off the shelf and yeah. off the website and everywhere. And Nash went crazy. He was ballistic over it. Um, uh, Cause he owned uh, thirty. He bought Scott Hall's piece. It was the three of them, right? Right. And he bought Scott Hall's piece, so he owned thirty four percent. And and he's told me candidly, 
uh, what the number is, and it's a lot of money, even now, in 2015, from NWO. Big time. So Kevin went to New York and flew up there, and they've agreed to put back on one of the shirts is on now. Yeah, the shirts are back up now, but they were down yeah. right after. Yeah, but how how do you, how could they have maneuvered that to, to own the NWO without you getting part of that, Eric? Well, because n- number one, you, you got to remember, I I was not part of WCW when WCW sold to um, WWE. Okay. So I I wasn't I hadn't really been involved. Well, I mean, not really. I hadn't been involved in any management decisions regarding WCW Return of Broadcasting um, as of September tenth, nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, I know. Anyway, I just I meant to ask you that. I thought about that because Kevin was, God, he was living. I just couldn't figure out how they were able to negotiate that kind of a deal. So this is. Well, I'll tell you what. Next time I see Kevin Nash, he's buying sushi and beer. Because- <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he can yeah. afford it. Yeah, he's doing well. I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> Good for him. Yeah. 